Hello everybody, this is Kelly Omond with the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. I'm an ecologist and botanist in the Science and Stewardship Department of the Foundation. And I would like to talk to you today about native plants on Nantucket and how we can plant for natural beauty and diversity. Uh, this presentation was originally prepared for the NHA Food for Thought series, and it was live on February 24th, 2021. Uh, we were unable to record, but we had a lot of requests to be able to hear a recorded version. So we're doing that here. So uh, Nantucket Conservation Foundation is one of the uh, larger conservation organizations on the island, and we own 9,000 plus acres of land. We're managing all of these properties for environmental conservation and for wildlife diversity and plant diversity. So uh, it's a very appropriate topic to talk to you about how you can help by planting things in your yard and helping to maintain connectivity between the natural areas. So why use native plants in your landscape? People are often wondering why, why it might be an important thing to do. So one of the key things is that it really helps maintain a sense of place. So it helps preserve a local uniqueness. Nantucket uh, is made up of a natural environment that includes a lot of species that have evolved here over thousands of years, plants with the wildlife. So uh, planting non-natives uh, really brings a lot of similarity to Nantucket with other places. And maintaining the native species really makes it more unique. So with native plants, you often use a lot less chemical inputs. You don't need to fertilize them because they're adapted for our types of soils. You don't need to provide a lot of water after they've first established. And you really don't use pesticides as much because you're really trying to promote the insects and the wildlife that would be sustained by these plants and it would be counterproductive. So native plants are also really beautiful and many are versatile in landscaping. They can be used in yards very easily. For instance, this winterberry holly that's pictured here on this slide. This is a species that in the, in the wild will grow in wetter areas around ponds and, and marshes, but it does really well in, in the landscape and it can, it can take mesic soil, which is moderately moist. As long as it's not too dry, it does great. And it's a beautiful plant providing foliage and um, fruit in the fall and then dropping its foliage in the winter. And then you get a beautiful display of the red berries. The red berries are very popular with birds. Around 50 species will utilize the, the fruit and the, the fruits stay on the plant late into the winter, providing a good winter food source. But not only that, it really supports a lot of other species that either feed on the leaves, such as uh, a type of elfin butterfly, the Henry's elfin, or uh, insects that may be uh, leaf mining inside the leaves or feeding on the, the pollen and nectar of the flowers. There are actually specialist bees that can only feed on certain types of plants. And there happens to actually be a native bee that feeds only on holly flowers. So by boosting uh, the native plants in your landscape, you can really add to biodiversity in a lot of ways. So you may ask, well, why is this important on Nantucket where we have so many wonderful conservation properties. You can see on this map that uh, almost half of the island is in conservation protected land, the light blue color. However, uh, there are some issues because with the urbanization and suburban areas that have developed over the last few decades, there's issues of connectivity between the conservation lands. Wildlife and insects can't really just pass through heavily developed areas. And if the less developed areas are populated in native species, there's really not much for them to use. So they don't really have an incentive to pass through and the ability to do so. So the other issue is really the spread of non-native species into natural areas. The more non-native species that are planted in people's landscapes, the more issues we see with non-native, especially invasive species popping up in our natural areas. The seeds get spread and um, before we know it, we're dealing with these problems in conservation lands that have never been planted or, or developed. So uh, a big topic these days has been the percent of native vegetation on the landscape. And there's been some research that suggests, especially for birds, that having um, around 70% of native vegetation on the landscape is what's needed to really keep um, the birds producing enough chicks and keep populations stable. And if you think about it, even if protected lands were only populated by native plants, 
more than half of the land area on Nantucket would then be potentially non-native vegetation and hard surfaces like paving or houses and buildings. So uh, we really need to boost the amount of native vegetation on private property and also manage invasives because they're spreading uh, whether we want them or not. So one of the research articles that I mentioned was this uh, Desiree Narongo's article and uh, her article was published in 2018. And she looked at uh, the Carolina chickadee and these birds require a lot of prey in the summer when they're raising their chicks, up to 1500 uh, caterpillars a day per chick. So uh, she was reporting that about 70% of the landscape really needs to be in, in native species to support this type of bird. And this makes sense that this would hold for a lot of species of bird that feed their young insects in the summer, especially uh, caterpillars and larval stages because they're easily digestible. So uh, very important. Also, plants provide really important services to the ecosystem, and we often tend to forget, we don't think about it, but plants are really our life support systems providing fresh air. They really improve the water quality by filtering what goes into the soil, removing nutrients and, and toxins. They're providing a cooling service with their shade. They're also evapotranspiring. So when they're, when they're photosynthesizing, they're putting out oxygen and water into the atmosphere, and that helps cool things off. They're great at storing carbon, especially large trees. So that helps mitigate uh, climate change issues. And finally, they're really important for erosion control. A lot of our native plants have extremely deep roots and good root systems that help hold soils in place, which is very important on an island where we have really serious erosion issues. And the native plants perform this service a lot better than uh, some of the superficially rooted non-native species. So one thing that people don't often understand is that plants are not ecologically interchangeable. Um, sure, you can have a big grass like the one on the right, the miscanthus or plume grass, or you can have a large grass on the left, the native switchgrass, but they're not the same. They might perform a similar service as a, as a landscape plant, but because the chemicals in each of these are different, the insects that have evolved here with the switchgrass would not be able to survive well on, or at all on the plume grass. There are chemicals that only insects in Africa would be adapted to, to consume. So it's really important to remember that, you know, plants are not a backdrop for life. They're actually part of the system. I wanted people to think a lot about what's in your yard and um, how, that, how that translates to insects and wildlife and the whole food web and the ecology of the island. One of the major situations with non-native species dominating the landscape is that there's a lot of food, but nobody can eat it. It's like having plastic plants and something that's completely inedible because our wildlife and our insects have not evolved to, to really consume these plants. They're not able to deal with any chemicals that are protective because they just haven't evolved those abilities. The other issue is that we're providing a lot of junk food. Uh, for instance, with shrubs like the bush honeysuckle or autumn olive, they do produce a lot of fruit. And I've had people tell me, oh, the birds love them. It must be really benefiting the birds. But they're really a sugary treat and they, they lack the proteins and fats that our native birds need for migration. So when birds are trying to bulk up before their migration, they're not getting what they need. And as mentioned before, because the plants are not native to the system, the insects and wildlife may not be adapted to consume the foliage. So we lose a lot of diversity of herbivorous insects by having these non-natives in our yard. So what do we really need? We need health food. Um, just like with humans, you can survive on some junk food, but you really need a lot of health food to be healthy. And native plants in this case are the health food. They provide the correct nutrients for, for a lot of insects that really, really are dependent on certain species and certain genera of plants. I wanted to show a couple case studies of particular species and that are common on Nantucket and how they're important. So this is a, a, a little uh, montage of the black cherry. You can see um, fruit, the flowers, and the foliage. And uh, the black cherry is really a high score in supporting a ton of species. 
uh, Talamy and Shropshire uh, did a review of the literature and they found that about 285 species of Lepidoptera, which are butterflies and moths, feed on the leaves at the caterpillar stage, like this Cecropia moth that's pictured here and the red spotted admiral butterfly that would feed in, during the larval stage on this species. Not to mention just the fruit, which is really popular and devoured by birds. The minute the uh, fruit ripen and turn black, they're eaten and um, they're just stripped off of, the, off of the trees. And in the spring when they're blooming, uh, they're a really important pollen, uh, pollen and nectar source for flies and bees, all these native insects that we never even really think of. So really one of those keystone species in our environment, even though it's considered a common species here and might be overlooked. Another high scorer is the genus Quercus, the oaks. Members of this genus support at least 410 species of butterflies and moths. So we're very fortunate on Nantucket to have really large areas of scrub oak shrubland, which is a very rare habitat regionally. Um, we're fortunate in the middle moors to have really large expanses of, of this scrub oak. And it supports a lot of species that are rare in, in the Northeast. For instance, the buck moth caterpillar, which is pictured here. And uh, these insects are all feeding on the oak leaves primarily, but also the, the fruit, the nuts, provide a lot of food to wildlife as well. So we've got the five native oak species on Nantucket, and um, including the tree oaks, which gives us a lot of diversity. So plants are not just our life support system, they really provide fuel to the ecosystem. They're feeding the food web. So really providing important nectar, fruit and seeds, foliage, and habitat value. So the specific requirements of structure that different organisms require. So having a place to raise their young, uh, places to feed, and places to hide. Preserving the native plant systems really preserves biodiversity, all of these things that we don't even see, and the ecological interactions between species that have evolved over thousands of years. Unfortunately, in recent decades, people have started observing a huge decline in insects, and not just rare insects, but also in common species of insects. This uh, article on the insect apocalypse uh, broke in 2018, and it really brought the issue to the public eye and out of the scientific community. And since then, uh, much more research has been done to look at this. Uh, really, people are realizing that there is a large um, problem going on here and trying to find all of the, all of the causes of the problem at this point. Uh, what we do in our yards really has an effect, so that's why we're here talking tonight. This article um, by Wagner et al. in 2021 is a really good summary of all the research that's been going on looking at insect declines. And it's, it's definitely um, more of a scientific article, but I do recommend it. And I love this graphic because they're showing the issues that are all affecting the insects. It's really a death by a thousand cuts, um, global threats to insects. It's not just one thing or another. There's not one specific cause for declines for everything, but there are a lot of things that are declining for all of these reasons. With climate change at the top of this circle, um, industrial agriculture, uh, introduction of non-native species, uh, suburbanization, and production of chemicals that, that harm insects, as well as the introduction of non-native species like maybe the fire ants that may kill off natives. So I urge you, if you're interested in reading this article, it's publicly available and it, it gives a good summary of all the, all the recent research. So I wanted to talk a bit about the native plant and landscaping mo movement and how it's developed. And, and these are also resources that you can just take a snapshot of once, it, once the slide is full. So the Native Plant Trust um, actually started in 1900 as the New England Wildflower Society. And they've been promoting the conservation and the use of native plants in landscaping for a very long time. You can check out their website at nativeplanttrust.org. And they also have this um, wonderful Go Botany website where you can use that to identify plants and view pictures and understand some of the plant diversity in New England. So this is a, a long, a long-lived, long-lasting uh, movement. 
uh, but it's really gained strength in, in recent years. Doug Tallamy, um, a researcher who is mostly an entomologist, uh, became really interested in looking at how insects, and especially native insects, are using plants in the landscape. And he published Bringing Nature Home First, and then recently Nature's Best Hope, and another book called The Living Landscape, which talks about gardening and how you can, you, how you can use your yard to really add to uh, ecology. He also has a website uh, called thehomegrownnationalpark.org, and you can check that out and become a member. And what this website does is it encourages people across the country to make their yard into a part of a vast network of lands filled with native plants. These books have all been really instrumental in getting the public really interested in this topic. And they're really easy to read and very interesting. I, I urge you to, to pick them up and give them, give them a check out. So um, Climate Wise Landscaping is a book that I really like. It's um, by Sue Reed and Ginny Stebalt. This book really um, feeds in well with this concept and it also talks about the climate, which is one of the major issues affecting insect and other, other species declines. So um, I would strongly recommend this book as well. So um, recently, um, been learning about the Yard Futures Project. And this is another um, national level project, and it's a research project designed to look at suburban, urban, and rural areas and compare how the different plants are across the landscape and how they're affecting the ecology and the soils and also how they may be storing carbon. So recently, uh, the Linda Loring Nature Foundation had a uh, science pub, and this is actually recorded and you can view it on their YouTube channel. It was a presentation by Desiree Narongo and Chris Neal. And it was a talk about the Yard Futures research and how they've been involved in it because they're um, local to New England. And this project includes uh, researchers all across the country and yards all across the country. So this is just a quick summary. Uh, there are a lot of other resources out there, but these are great places to start and delve into the, pro uh, the problem of native plants and how they are needed in the landscape and what you can do at your own yard level. So I really wanted to talk uh, locally and um, delve and take some examples of non-native and native plants in our Nantucket gardens. And this is not to plant shame anybody, this is just to consider logically and discuss you know, what the species that we're planting are really bringing us. So you can see on the left, we've got a privet hedge, which is a very familiar site on Nantucket, pretty much ubiquitous. And on the right, a typical house uh, with, with landscaping of hydrangeas, which are non-native, and a few other non-native species that you can't really identify from this picture. So I thought, well, let's take a few of the most commonly planted non-native shrubs on Nantucket and see what they get us for biodiversity and you know, wildlife value in general. So um, top of the list is the really commonly planted mop head hydrangea with the electric blue flowers or bright pink flowers. This is a non-native species and so are all the other, two, the other two. The privet hedge, which is shown here in bloom with the white flowers that bloom usually in May, late May, early June and the salt spray rose, which is a non-native rose to New England. It was introduced very early during colonization and it's actually from Asia. So I did a table here just to show kind of in general how these non-native species stack up and what they provide in terms of food and fuel services to the ecosystem. So um, you can see really that uh, these are not high scorers. Uh, for instance, the hydrangea, because it's sterile, it doesn't produce any seeds. So there's no seeds available. And nectar and pollen are missing because the flowers are sterile. Because it's not native to the system, none of the insects that are native here have evolved to feed on the leaves. So there's really low diversity of insects feeding on the foliage. It can be used by generalist predators, so spiders that are able to hang their web anywhere and just catch insects that are flying through. The salt spray rose and the privet have sort of a similar situation where they, ser they serve better value um, because the fruit are consumed by wildlife and the nectar and pollen are provided for the generalist species of pollinators. So like butterflies and honeybees and some of our native bees that are generalists and can survive on pretty much any type of nectar or pollen. But again, because they're not native to the system, 
the insects have not really evolved to eat the foliage. So they're really um, pretty sterile for herbivorous insects. And again, the predators are really going to be generalist spiders or something like that that can hang their web and catch insects that happen to be passing through. So not, not a very great um, value to our system ecologically for any of these three species. So I thought, well, so I thought, well, what about if you could um, change what you're planting and just substitute some native alternatives that are readily available in the landscaping industry? So the Virginia rose could be a good uh, substitute for the non-native salt spray rose. The chokeberry is a beautiful shrub, could be used for a hedge or for an individual planted in the middle of your landscape. Beautiful flowers and fruit for wildlife. And the um, clethra, the sweet pepper bush, which has beautiful white flowers with a, with a strong fragrance later in the season. So how do these native species stack up? They really are re really very different from the, the previous three species that were not native. You can see um, producing fruit and seeds. They've got all kinds of um, seed predators and birds and, and small rodents that can, that can feed on the fruit and the seeds. They provide nectar and pollen, including to specialist insects and generalists. So even hummingbirds and butterflies and native bees can use these plants. The leaves, because the plants are native to the system, are eaten by many species. So leaf miners, caterpillars, beetles, uh, insects like um, katydids or um, grasshoppers can all feed on these plants because they've adapted to over thousands of years. Because there's a lot more insects going on in these plants, it really provides uh, a lot of energy for higher in the food chain. So we can have some snakes, we can support some frogs, uh, birds, bats are eating the insects that are, that are provided from the shrub understory or the shrubs in your yard. And there's a whole world of parasitoid insects that are feeding on the herbivorous insects. So you really get this massive increase in diversity just by trading out and putting in some of these native species, along with several others that are really easily um, readily available and can be used in your landscape. This is by no means a, an, a be all and end all list, just a, just a few options. So a lot of people say, well, what if I just keep my, most of my yard the way it is and I, and I turn over a portion of my lawn into a wildlife or pollinator meadow? And you know, can't that serve the same purpose? And, and, and will that be good enough? So there are a lot of things to consider. And one of them is really um, foremost, are these species native? Um, are they native to North America or to New England or to Nantucket? And the native species are going to do the most in supporting native biodiversity of insects because of those ecological relationships that have adapted over time. And we do kind of prefer species that are native to Nantucket or to the ecoregion, which would be Cape and Islands. So blooming times, you want to make sure you choose a mix of wildflowers that um, bloom over a long period of time. But it doesn't have to be one species blooming all summer. What you want is have multiple species that bloom at different times uh, across the season and hopefully um, different species from different families. So you're attracting different types of insects. You want to have host plants. So you want to include plants to feed the caterpillars. And that means maybe having a cherry tree or some oak trees or some shrubs because a lot of the butterflies really require these woody species as host plants. You want to provide some other habitat hotspots if you're really serious about this. You want to keep some logs or some wood pile for bees that require um, woody habitats to substrates to build their nests. We want some open sandy soil and leaving some of last year's leaves can really benefit because a lot of the chrysalises and eggs are stored in the leaves over the winter. And providing a water source can really add diversity too because the insects need some water sources too when it's dry late in the summer. You also need to make a plan to manage the area, either with your landscaper or on your own if you don't have a landscaper. What will it need? Because just planting it isn't really going to get you the results that you want. You want to be able to make sure that you're maintaining it properly. And part of that is making sure that you leave at least a third of it unmown each year. And that's because a lot of insects will actually bore into the stems of plants and they'll, they'll leave their eggs there. So you want to leave some standing as a refuge 
for the next season. Otherwise, you won't have any young insects like moths and butterflies and bees attracted to your system. So I thought it would be interesting to take a look at some typical commercial wildflower mixes for the Northeast. I just did a simple Googling for New England or Northeast wildflower mixes and um, came up with this one that seems kind of typical. And they, they give you a species list. They don't give you um, scientific names. So you can't be absolutely certain of the species in many cases. But as a botanist, I'm looking at this and really only three species are really native to New England. And none of these three species are native to Nantucket. So this is going to get you a lot of species that are not native to North America and then some Midwestern species, which won't really fit with the native insects that are really specialized here on Nantucket. So not really the best wildflower mix. So I thought, well, there must be uh, some other seed mixes that might be more targeted to New England and have more species that are native to New England and Nantucket. And this was another species list that I found for, for another wildflower mix, which is better. I really like how they break it down by season. They give you the scientific names and they make it easier for you to understand um, how this might look across the season. However, uh, there only were really three species on this list that are actually native to Nantucket. And one of them, the wild columbine, is actually very rare or possibly extirpated on the island. I've never seen it growing in the wild. It's only really found in gardens, as far as I can tell. And at the bottom of the list, um, they use a type of hair grass that's not actually native to New England, or at least not to Nantucket. Uh, where they could have chosen um, little blue stem or switchgrass or our native hair grass to Shamsia flexuosa. So not ideal. Um, a lot of these species are probably more reasonable for the, for the insect species that we have here, but not exact matches. And you have to do also consider because these species may have similar habitat requirements in their native range, which might be a little bit south and west of here, that they might do really well in our conditions and could become established on the island and could be added to the Nantucket flora. We don't know what the effects of that would be, whether they would spread and possibly cause problems for actual Nantucket native species, but it's something to consider. So a better mix, but not perfect. And one of the things that could be better for you as a homeowner would be to plant um, a single species mix or a few species of different, um, different, different grasses, and then add diversity of wildflowers to an area using plugs or potted plants. So then you really get to choose what you're adding to your wildflower meadow. So another cautionary tale is with our native rose mallow, the um, hibiscus moschutos, which is our native hibiscus here. The pink form is our native form. And since I've been here for about 13 years, I've been looking for the white form with the dark centers, which is on the left. Uh, and I've never found it growing in Nantucket until last year. Someone reported it to me and I went to check it out. And it was in a natural area where I had never seen the white form with the red centers before along my comet pond. And I really took a close look at it and the plants are much taller than our native form and the leaves have red petioles, which is the stem of the leaf. And the leaves are actually a different shape and are reddish. So in investigating this, I think that this may be the, a non-native type that's been introduced. So probably people planting a non-native form of rose mallow in their yards and then the pollen being carried into the native population. So um, using native plants has some, some issues because you may be using a plant that you got at a, at a nursery that may have either a hybrid origin. So it may be a hybrid with another species of hibiscus or it might just be a form that's not here on Nantucket. And we really don't know what the effects are. Obviously this, um, this species was doing quite well um, along the pond shore and the non-native form um, did fine too. So we could see a shift in the type of flowers that we have here, which is something new and may never have occurred here in Nantucket history. So another cautionary tale, um, we have a native New England blazing star, which is the one on the top here. And on the left, you can see a Midwestern blazing star. The native New England blazing star is actually considered very rare in our region, and it's listed as special concern by the state of Massachusetts. So in order to propagate or plant it, you're supposed to have a permit to be able to do that here. 
And um, if you are interested in having a wildflower meadow, typically what people will do is substitute an analog species from the Midwest. So they'll take this Midwestern blazing star and plant it in their yard or in their garden. So the issue with that is it could hybridize with our native New England blazing star. They bloom in, in overlap in blooming time, and we don't know what effect that would have. And also it would not necessarily support any insects that would be supported by the native New England blazing star. There could be enough of a difference. So these are all things we need to consider when we're, when we're making changes and using native plants in the landscape. Wanted to talk briefly a bit about the native Nantucket Conservation Foundation and our native plant initiatives that we've been working on. We do a lot of habitat management and research, and we've been doing that for many years. We use native plants in road and trail restoration. We raise the plants ourselves in our greenhouse mainly, and then we plant them in areas that need to be revegetated with a diverse mix of plants. We also do a lot of invasive species management, so we're removing or treating invasive species and then trying to add back the native diversity. And our goal is always really to boost biodiversity and reduce erosion and keep, keep things in a more natural state using native, native material, native genotype material that comes specifically from our other properties. But we also wanted to get into the demonstration and education business a lot more because we're seeing more of the island developed. We wanted to provide some models for what people can do in their own landscape and either commercial or in their own home. So we'll be talking a little bit about the native plant landscaping at our office. At the Nantucket Conservation Foundation office on 118 Cliff Road, we did a large project in 2019 where we removed a lot of the plants that were existing around the, the building. And um, there were a lot of species that were non-native. Only two out of the 10 species in that area were actually native. We removed some invasives and some low value shrubs that just didn't really have much to offer to wildlife and insects. We backfilled with sand and we, we had to uh, wait to do our, the rest of our project because of COVID. So we waited until the fall and we were able to get material. We had a nice design done for the landscaping by one of our board members, Dave Shampoo. And we were able to obtain the material from Surfing Hydrangea Nursery and plant it with our properties maintenance crew, put up some deer fencing to protect it over the winter. And we increased the diversity to include 15 native species. Most of them are straight species and a few are native ours. And native ours are cultivars that have been selected from native species. So maybe ones that have a particular color of um, foliage in the fall, like the blueberries that you can see turning red in this landscape, or uh, dwarf form like the inkberry or the uh, summer sweet, the clethra, sweet pepper bush. So uh, we did this planting project and we were luckily able to retain some of the important native species that were in the in the landscape. This uh, large mature clump of native beech plums were, were retained and we planted inkberry around them. Again the deer fencing is really needed to establish your plants. We did have species selected that are deer resistant or deer tolerant so we don't expect a huge amount of deer damage but the plants really need time to establish so we'll be removing the fencing in the spring. So this project was um, really funded by the Nantucket Garden Club in part, and um, they gave us a grant. You'll be able to come look at these species at the, uh, at the new landscape, and we're hoping to do some educational activities. You can see here just some of the variety of species available at the site. We're gonna be putting up signage so you can walk through the yard and see all of the things that, that are planted and learn about how they connect to the eco ecological system. We also had this large area at the office that had been overgrown with non-native species, a tangle of non-native shrubs and vines. So working with our properties maintenance crew, we were able to pull those out manually. And then we did some backfilling with sand and a thin layer of topsoil. So we were able to retain some really nice native species of shrubs and trees, and then also some non-natives that were not considered problematic. The next stage was growing out some uh, native species. So we used native collected seed, uh, locally collected on Nantucket from our properties. We planted approximately um, 30 different species of, of plants through this wildflower meadow area. 
that were selected to have as many different plant families and species and genera represented. So we'll have the maximum input for biodiversity. This area will also have signs uh, sponsored by the Nantucket Garden Club, and people will be able to come to the site for um, garden landscaping tours and some natural history tours once the plants get established and we start seeing more native insects using the property along with birds and other wildlife. We are planning to collect more seed and um, install more plants this year and get the signage installed. And hopefully, depending on COVID regulations going forward, we'll be able to have some small groups to tour the property, you know, wearing masks and with social distancing this year. We're hoping in the future to use this area sort of as a demonstration to be able to use pictures to educate people and also potentially to do some workshops. So you may be eager at this point to really get started on your own native landscaping. And I wanna urge you to check out uh, our landscaping with native plants on Nantucket pamphlet that was developed with the MBI and uh, the Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative. So you can uh, find this on the nantucketbiodiversity.org um, website, or you can uh, check it out on the Nantucket Conservation Foundation website, nantucketconservation.org. Or you can just drop me an email and my email address will be at the end of the presentation. So this will help you to figure out what you might want in your yard and what you already have in your yard. Uh, use that GoBotany website to learn what you have. Uh, you can make a plan with phases. Uh, figure out the best place to start, which is often removing some of the problem invasive plants. And those are pretty easy to pinpoint. And you can plan to replace one area at a time, or you can do a larger project with a greater a greater capacity for, um, for construction. You want to define your goals based on the size of your yard and what you want to attract and where you live. So uh, there are a lot of different uh, plant communities on the island and you want to be able to fit in with that and also with the conditions at your site. And this uh, native plant pamphlet will help you out in that respect because it tells you what the requirements of different plants are, gives you the species names and what types of best uses they have. You can really uh, work with your landscaper if you have one and explain your goals. They can help you with design and really work with you to get what you want installed. Be clear why you're asking for native plants and um, the more they understand what you want, the better, the better it will end up working out. And you also need to make a maintenance plan with your landscaper and or with yourself uh, and learn to be able to leave some areas of leaf cover in the fall and standing vegetation. And uh, to try to prevent um, over manicuring your lawn is really also a good suggestion. So using less um, herbicides on your lawn and changing the mowing regime and accepting having a bit of a wild lawn can really add to the biodiversity in your yard along with minimizing the size of your lawn. So I chose this as one of the last slides, and it's an article that's also a scientific article, uh, Declines in Insect Abundance and Diversity. And I really like the rest of their title, which is We Know Enough to Act Now. And I think what's really promising about uh, this topic is that we can act in our own yard and our, our impacts in our own yard will spread across the landscape. We don't have to wait for a huge government initiative or for rules banning invasives. We can really start planting natives in our yard and begin to see some of this diversity come back. We want our children, grandchildren, to be able to see uh, fireflies in their yard and monarch butterflies. And we want the system to be intact going forward as much as possible. So definitely we know enough to act now, even though we don't know everything about what's causing insect declines and other declines of native species, we definitely know there's a problem. So um, I had this slide up for questions and discussions, but I wanted to leave it in even though this isn't a live presentation. You can feel free to email me at kaomond at nantucketconservation.org and check out our website, which is nantucketconservation.org. And please uh, get in touch if you have any questions about native plants and landscaping or what's in your yard. I'm happy to talk with people. And this is the way we get the word out. Thanks so much for listening and hope everybody has learned a lot and can start working on their native plantings in their yards.